Who the Wild Things Are with Ryan McGuire. You gotta listen to your body. Oh my God, maybe, you know, I could get out there. I could do this. Let's take a ride. Find your wild side. Real stories. See with your own eyes. It's so beautiful. I'm gonna have the best time out here. Yeah, I was in tears. I was just like, that's the best, man. Welcome back to Who the Wild Things Are. My name is Ryan McGuire, and I'm here to bring you conversations with the most wild folks on the planet. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave us a rating and review on your podcast platform of choice. And if you enjoy the episode, share it with a friend. Appreciate you guys. Let's get it going. Let's cut a piece of wood. Custom. <laughs> All right. This one has blood in it. <laughs> Amazing. Are we, ready, guys? Are we live? Are we cool. Eric, thanks for uh thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. First official podcast in the new studio. I love it. Congratulations. It looks amazing. I feel like we got a little place where ducks could hang out over there. We got the globe so we can pick where we want to go on some of our future adventures. Yeah, you just spin this guy and then... Yeah, I love it. Just point. Yeah, uh, we'll go to Australia Los tomorrow. Ja- Los Angeles, it looks like. <laughs> um, so I'm curious, uh, the drink you've got in front of you, is that a biohacking thing or are we drinking pee now? Is that what's going on? Yeah. So there's a lot of studies that show that pee is heavy in electrolytes, uh, so it's really good good post-workout it's a good pre-workout wow and it's it's my own pee so you know i don't see anything that's wrong with it um no it's obviously just electrolytes in there that looks like pee it's kind of a funny color <laughs> well i appreciate you coming on uh i think i don't know it's been a while since the last episode we did but yeah. i think you've uh you live a busy life so there's a lot more to talk about and a lot of a lot of new stuff in your life so hopefully we can hit on some of that let's dive in um one thing one story and I know we like to mess around a lot, but this is a very serious question. Mm-hmm. We touched on this a little bit in the last podcast. So if you didn't catch the last one, go check it out. Would you say that you should get an advantage in your competitions because you're an adaptive athlete? Yeah, I definitely <laughs> should. So um, for those unfamiliar with watching me bench press, I have this finger that doesn't <laughs> bend from the knuckle down, which is from a bike crash back in, I can't remember if it was 2013 or 14, but it's actually a great story around this. Um, I was 10 days out from Ironman Lake Placid. I think you know this full story, maybe not, but 10 days out from Ironman Lake Placid, and I mean, I've, I've basically trained four years to like do well in Lake Placid so I can get to Kona. And I'm on Apulia Road in Jamesville, New York, just a routine, like hour and 15 minute ride, just cruising along, hot, humid day in July. And like, I was obsessed with the numbers back then, making sure that like heart rate monitor was working and it was tracking my heart rate and watts were working and something was off. I can't remember if it was my watts or my heart rate, but I was finicking around with my bike computer and on a triathlon bike, you're tucked in like this. And I raised one of my arms to play with my bike computer and my arm slipped on the aero pad and I was going about 25 miles per hour. And I just went flying off into a ditch and skidded for a while. And my first thought was, I thought I lost my chin. And honestly, the reason why I have facial hair and have had facial hair since 2013 is because I had a nasty scar on my chin. I had to get about 30 stitches on my chin because I literally just like skidded on my my chin. And uh, so anyways, I'm like way out in the country. I don't have cell phone service and I'm bloody and (laughs) I'm hitchhiking essentially for the one car that passes by every 10 minutes. So this guy picks me up in his pickup truck. We throw my bike in the, in the back of his truck, and uh, he takes me to where I have service so I can call my girlfriend at the time who comes to pick me up. Um, she's in healthcare, so you know I thought that it was going to help get me into a hospital like soon to get this taken care of, but end up waiting for about five hours in ER to finally get in to see um, a doctor that can clean it out and stitch it up. And... So they do that, and uh, while I'm while I'm in the room with the with the nurse, I'm like, "So do you think I'm gonna be able to swim tomorrow? Like, I got an Ironman coming up in ten days. Like, I'm definitely biking and running. I know that's not an issue, but you know, can I swim with the stitches?" And she's like, "You're not gonna want to do anything tomorrow. Trust me." And I'm like, "Oh no, no, I will." And the next day, I definitely was biking and running. I just put a bag over my hands so the sweat wouldn't get in the stitches. Um, I couldn't swim though until basically race day. And 
three days before the race, I had the stitches taken out, but this finger was just gnarly. It was so infected. It was pink. I couldn't put any pressure on it. It hurt so bad. And some doctors advised me not to do the race. And a couple who were Ironman athletes as well, they were like, well, you know, like you're really fit. We know you want to do it. You'll probably get to Kona. So we're not going to tell you no. So I took their advice. And, uh, I asked the race officials if I could buddy tape my fingers together because it hurt too bad to like swim without my fingers all taped together. So the race officials let me do that. But I was really nervous about getting my wetsuit on and off because it hurt so bad to put any pressure on my finger because it was so badly infected. And also, you get going upwards of 60 miles per hour on the Ironman Lake Placid course, descending on a triathlon bike in this tucked in position. That year it was raining. So I was really nervous about like all I had for grip was this, like these fingers, this part of my hand was all super swollen. All I could do was grip with these two fingers on my handlebars. So I was nervous about that. Um, so cannon goes off at Ironman Lake Placid. The adrenaline trumps, you know, any of the pain that was going to be experienced. I end up crushing the race, qualifying for Kona. But um, because of the infection and because of probably swimming in that water, more infection, it, uh, it damaged the cartilage and damaged my joint in this finger such that I can't bend it anymore. So this is why when you guys see me push pressing and bench pressing, I got this little finger that sticks up. That's impressive. I mean, still putting up big numbers even, uh, even with four fingers. So. That's true. Yeah, I'm a very strong adaptive athlete. Imagine if you had five. It'd be crazy, yeah. yeah. I, I think maybe that was like... Uh, the universe just like tempering your expectations like we got to back this guy up a little bit he's <laughs> progressing too fast i think so i actually was nervous when it happened that i wasn't gonna be able to do pull-ups again i wasn't gonna be able to deadlift a lot of weight because i was concerned that i would lose my grip and i mean you've been injured enough to know like when you're injured the not knowing part is what sucks the most and i was like doing all of these head games like all right well maybe i'm just meant to be a swimmer biker and runner i'll never deadlift again i'll never do crossfit again so be it but obviously i can still do crossfit yeah it's such a it's such a important part of of the injury process is the mental component like yeah i've been going through that and it's uh it's tough you even text me you're like just take it one day at a time you'll be fine yeah yeah i mean i've experienced it enough now and you probably have too but still whenever we do get injured it's that scary situation of like not knowing when you're going to be able to get back to doing what you love doing and yeah it's scary to think about like not running again and not deadlifting again because you have a lower back injury but i don't know generally i feel like if you give it some time let it heal like you can get back to exactly where you were before yeah it, it's the not knowing and it's also the the daily like dopamine and endorphin hit that yeah we rely on so much from like moving our bodies when that's taken away you're instantly a less happy yeah like more grumpy person and it's like can't a really anymore. miserable feeling yeah yeah how do you get your high if you can't exercise and it's such a um, important part for all of us that are athletes. Many of us are doing it for that feeling more so than the performance side of it. Just the mental clarity and the positive energy and the mood booster. Yeah, maybe we just got to start getting drunk and high now. That's, yeah. And just give up the sports and <laughs> <laughs> just completely switch gears. Yeah. So outside of the uh, the athletic realm, your focus, at least from where I sit, is really on building brands. And mm -hmm. I feel like that is definitely elevated even like over the last 12 months mm -hmm. uh how do you how has your life changed like as you've kind of grown your business and grown so many other businesses specifically like over this last 12 month period yeah i mean i've had different chapters of my life where some have been very much about business and building businesses some were very much about athletics and iron man and getting to the world championships and so my, my Instagram profile used to read what, six years ago when I was thir or eight years ago when I was 34, retired at 34, exploring the world most days shirtless. And uh, I'm still exploring the world most days shirtless, but I'm certainly not retired anymore. I feel like the last two or three years, I've really ramped up the business side of things again, which has been fun. I mean, it weaves in with my lifestyle, but 
Um, yeah, where I am now, um, I'm helping others build their brands. I work with about 25 different brands and I'm more of a consultant to them. There's definitely a component to it where, you know, I'm creating awareness, posting um, content on my Instagram feed, TikTok, YouTube, but <clears throat> I'm also introducing um, the companies to investors. I'm introducing the companies to other ambassadors. I'm helping them with all the communication channels that I've seen to be successful um, for ambassador programs introducing them to distribution channels, introducing, this is a big one, <clears throat> introducing founders of companies to other founders of companies. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's just like people can fast track success if you have a mentor that's already done it. So a lot of times I'll introduce the founder of a company who's already built a $100 million company to someone who's at 10 million revenue and looking to ramp it up. And, you know, that person can really expedite the process for, um, the other founder. So I do a lot of that. And I mean, the way I think of it is I've owned businesses, I've co-founded businesses. You know, I understand that if I'm paying dollars to, for marketing, like I want to get a return on my investment. So with every deal I take, I'm like, can I provide ROI for this company? So for me, that means, does it weave in well with my lifestyle? Is it something that my audience is going to be receptive to? Is it going to be something that is easy for me to post because I'm wearing it, I'm using it, um, I love the service? Um, is it uh, a company that isn't already super well known? Like mm. I don't want to work with the largest companies in the world and just be a billboard for them. I want to work with companies like Kane and Beam and 10,000 where not everyone already knows about them. So again, I can add a ton of value through my audience. And I also feel like my audience looks to me for the latest and greatest, you know, kind of like that hype beast or uncreate like what are the cool new consumer brands out there so <clears throat> you know how, how can i add value for my audience and how can i add value for the company and making sure that i'm only taking on brand deals where i can really provide roi and relationships are super meaningful to me i want a direct connection to the founder i want to build a relationship with the founder i don't want to again just like get paid to post a picture i'm not that doesn't I, I don't care about the money as much anymore. I care so much more about the relationship and adding value. Mm. And is there, what? I guess, what's the frequency? Because I'm sure it happens that you get approached about a product. They send you the product, the ingredients. Let's say it's a drink or some kind of food and the, the ingredients are great. Mm -hmm. Looks like it falls in line with your mission and it's big trash. And mm -hmm. you're just like, I am not doing this. It, like, mm -hmm. does that happen? And you just have to turn them down? Yeah, definitely. I mean, for every 10 incoming deals, I take one. So, gotcha. and again, I mean, it has to fit into like all of those metrics. I want it to be a really, really good fit. So yeah, there's a lot of them that come my way that are just like a one-off pay to post or a big company saying, Hey, you know, promote something at Walmart for us. So there's a lot that I, I don't take. Mm. And it, it's typically, what's the main reason? Is it usually the product being something that you don't really enjoy or is it, is it a different metric? Yeah, it's not even so often that anymore. I mean, you know, I feel like the companies that are reaching out are generally in the health and wellness space. You know, I'm not getting products outside of what I would generally talk about. It's more so, is it going to be a good relationship? Mm -hmm. I look at these things as, you know, six month, 12 month, multi year relationships. Sure. And if it's not going to be that again, like I'm not, I'm not a model. I don't want to just take a picture and, you know, post holding something up. I want to build brands. I want to help founders create awareness. I want to help companies really scale and I want to add value for my audience. So that's another big component of it is, you know, is it a cool consumer brand that I think my audience is going to be receptive to? Right on. And I feel like you've done a great job of building community here in Colorado to the point where folks really trust you. What's the what was the motivation for coming to Colorado? Because you're originally an mm -hmm. East Coast guy. Yeah, from Syracuse, New York. The motivation was I just kind of felt like I had grown out of the environment in, in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. um, I had been traveling quite a bit from 2012 up until 2017 when I moved here. And Whenever I went to like LA or New York, I just felt like I really clicked with the people there more. 
Um, and I also felt like, especially a place like LA, like that environment just filled my cup so much. The sun shining, you know, being able to run in the Santa Monica mountains or being able to run along the ocean, you know, bouncing to different fitness studios, lots of healthy restaurants. I was having super engaging conversations with people out there. I just felt like it was more my tribe. And, you know, I had so many great friends in, in Syracuse, New York, but I feel like we all, you know, over time can outgrow our environment or outgrow our friend group. And I started to feel that way as my life shifted from, you know, partying like a rock star to training like a rock star and, and doing Ironman. And I just wanted to be around more athletes and I wanted to be around more risk takers. Mm. And, you know, in upstate New York, it's definitely not as much of a risk taking mentality as it is going to a city where it's all transplants. Like those are generally more adventurous people and more risk taking people. So when I came to Colorado in 2017, I was in Boulder and I just like really clicked with the people there. I ran Mount Sanitas every day. I ran the Boulder bike path every day, jumped in Boulder Creek, um, just had a blast in Boulder. And I'm like, damn, I really like Colorado. And Venice and Santa Monica were the other place that were on my radar. Um, and then I came back again to Colorado to three months after that first trip. And it was during that trip, I was introduced to some guys who went to Syracuse University and they were telling me about a townhouse they had right by the Bronco Stadium and that one of their housemates had recently moved out. It was a rooftop space that looked out at the city skyline. So I hadn't been to Denver yet. City unseen, townhouse unseen. I was like, I'll take that room. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the next day I find myself driving with them in the car to Target to buy things to move into this you know, little room that um, I had just committed to. And like I had a, a beautiful condo back in Syracuse, 4,000 square feet, um, you know, all the all the amenities that you could imagine and nice cars and nice clothes and just like a nice life. But I was so much happier just sleeping on a mattress with like three different outfits in Colorado than I was going back to this grand lifestyle that I had in, in upstate New York. So that to me was like, wow, environment and people matter so much for, mm -hmm. for my happiness. So for a year, I had a motorcycle for transportation out here in Colorado. I drove it year round, obviously not when it was snowing, but if it was cold, I would just bundle up and I still would drive that for my transportation. I walked a lot whenever it was snowing, I would just walk around to places. And then after a year of renting that space, I'm like, I really want to make Colorado like my primary residence. So I, uh, I started renting a place in, in Rhino and subsequently had a lot of my stuff shipped out from Syracuse and, you know, now in the last year have, have bought, you know, the kind of house of our dreams where we can entertain from a health and wellness standpoint. But yeah, it was environment and people. They're so, so important to me for happiness. Just an environment that makes it easy for you to thrive. Like the mountains here are just always begging us to be outside, playing in them. You know, the people in here, the people here are, you know, the the... What I get asked to do is always like outdoor adventure, workouts, sauna, cold exposure. It's never like, hey, do you want to go out drinking? Do you want to go to a club? Do you want to go to a you know late dinner party? So yeah, your environment, I really feel like shapes your, your reality so much. Yeah, I, I feel like it's really hard to be bored here. Yeah. Like every day that that we have like some kind of downtime, like whatever it is, an hour in the afternoon or the evening, it's either like you're getting in the mountains, you're snowboarding, you're trying out a new sport. Like the amount of new sports I've tried this year, or I'm, you just got really into fat biking and now mm -hmm. you're like head over heels for that. It's just constantly trying new things outdoors. So Yeah, there's so many options here. But at the same time, like New York City for me is stressful because there's too many options. There's uh -huh. too many people hitting me up to do things. There's like I, I get overwhelmed with FOMO when I'm in a place like New York, Miami, L.A., <clears throat> and I love all those places. But from a lifestyle standpoint, I like a little smaller city with a few less options so I don't feel like I'm just inundated with options. Um, and, yeah, I mean, we do have lots of options for outdoor recreation here, but I feel like it's less options than you would have in a major city and, you know, a few less things going on so you don't feel like you're missing out all the time for sure so in terms of fitness stuff for this year what's what's kind of your main focus what are you spending most of your time training for yeah so 
I mean, what I'm spending most of my time training for is just to have a perfect day every day. That is first and foremost for me. I'm 42. You know, I'm no longer a super competitive athlete, like trying to win races. It's more like I know what I need to do every day to be the best version of myself and feel really good and, you know, hopefully provide impact. So that's what I'm training for ultimately. But as far as competitions that are on the calendar, um, High Rocks U.S. Championships are coming up in two weeks. Um, February in Chicago, um, Go Ruck Games, I just got invited to. Um, I have to watch it on YouTube to see what that all consists of, but I said yes. Uh, <laughs> I think I'll be fine for it. I'm assuming it's a bunch of running and lifting sandbags, and um, I think there's wrestling involved, so we'll have to wrestle some so I can prepare for that. You don't want these problems. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what else do I have coming up? I have the Miami Half Marathon this weekend. Um, with a weight vest. That's more of a fun thing, though, that we're doing for 10,000. I do the Ultimate Hawaiian Trail Run every year in Kauai um, with a ruck, uh, go ruck pack on. That's also, you know, more of just like a fun event. Uh, potentially High Rocks World Championships. We'll kind of see when April rolls around, how busy I am, if I want to go there and, and do that. Um, I just sent this to you. I want to do that triple bypass ride, yeah. like 120 miles going over three mountain passes. Um, I'm more interested in stuff like that, you know, stuff that are going to be really experiential. Um, I'm dabbling with the idea of doing a half Ironman at the end of this year, just because our good friend Bickle wants to do one in like October in Arizona. And, you know, for me to get back there, it wouldn't be too hard outside of the swimming. Yeah. You know, I can easily ramp up the biking. I can easily ramp up the running to do just fine with it. But I would definitely have to get back in the pool because I haven't swam. Last time I swam was, I think, three or four years ago. I was at Vail Pass and I had just gotten <laughs> sent a, a new pair of fancy goggles by a company. And uh, Vail Pass is at like 10,800 feet and there's, uh, there's a beautiful lake up there. <laughs> and uh, I jumped in and thought I would easily be able to swim across it, which maybe was like 400, 800 yards, nothing crazy. And I get like 100 yards out and I'm just like sucking wind. And I was with a group of like 10 people. I had to tuck my tail and just kind of like doggy paddle my way back in. I'm like, damn, I've lost my swimming fitness and it was a high elevation. So I will have to get back in the pool if I do that. But that's the, yeah. Yeah, that's where I'm at. Yeah, that's a lot to unpack there. So I might also do the Ironman or half Ironman with mm -hmm. you. The swimming is definitely the thing that I have no idea. I, I feel like I'm made to swim, love to surf, but I don't know how to breathe in mm -hmm. the water. It turns out you can't breathe when you're underwater. Mm -hmm. This is something <laughs> I learned. So I'm going to have to figure out or pick your brain about yeah. like how to breathe. But It's a steep learning curve. Swimming, you know, if you're an athlete, you're long. So, I mean, you would pick it up really fast. It really is just about that. The body position and the breathing. The breathing comes pretty fast. The body position takes a really long time. It's in a month you can become a good swimmer it's going to take you five years to become a great swimmer. Like there's such, you need to put in so many yards to go from here to like here. Yeah. <laughs> but to big... go from here to here, it's, it's not that bad if you already have some aerobic base and some strength. Um, for me, what helped a ton was swimming with a pool buoy. Um, that way you don't have to focus about focus on like having your ass up in the water and you can really just focus on your stroke and your breathing. How does that work? What, I don't even know what a pool yeah, buoy pool is. Buoy is um, it's basically just a, a buoyancy device that you put in between your legs so that you don't really even have to think about kicking. It just goes in between your thighs and it just it, it keeps your ass floating in the water so you can just focus on your stroke and the breathing. And uh, yeah, for me, Iron Man's breathing was swim, swim, breathe. It was like two strokes breath, two strokes breath. I, you, I wasn't breathing every stroke. You're alternating shoulders that you Correct. breathe over? Okay. Yeah, your stroke, stroke, breathe, breathe. stroke, stroke breathe okay yeah well i'm gonna have to figure that out it's kind of like double unders where it's not really fitness limited it's more just limited by understanding the motor mechanics and getting that down in the movement pattern well i have no excuse because across literally across the street like i can it. see 
open water swimming, biking, running. It's like yeah. there's literally no reason I shouldn't be able to figure it out. Yeah, I mean, when I was training for Ironman, that was my Syracuse chapter, and I was riding upwards of five and a half hours indoors on a trainer. You know, I was doing upwards of two-hour runs, sometimes on a treadmill if it was super icy and, and cold and snowy outside. And I was swimming at 5.30 a.m. in this dungeon at the YMCA. I mean, it was just no frills. We have like the best place in the world to train for Ironman here. So I am kind of intrigued about it just because the environment like will, I, I think, just breed success for us in training and enjoyment. Whereas I got to a point in Syracuse where I was very much just going through the motions because I felt like that was my identity and I had to. Sure. So switching gears to High Rocks, which is more of your focus now, mm -hmm. Do you have a goal for Chicago or for the rest of the season? What's what's kind of uh, the, the end goal with High Rocks? Yeah, uh, goal is, I mean, just to kind of test my fitness and see where I'm at. I've really ramped up the running the last two months. My run pace has dropped tremendously at an aerobic heart rate. So, yeah, I'm excited to see how my running fitness, because the other High Rocks is, you know, I'm training CrossFit. I run here and there. I bike. You know, it's not like I'm not prepared for it, but I've definitely really focused on the running, ramping up for it. And I've just, this is the time of year too, where I run a lot because I can't mountain bike. So a lot of things for me are just really seasonal. Um, if I can't mountain bike, you know, I want to get my 60 minutes of aerobic conditioning in. Running is very accessible. Um, I mean, goal would be to win age group and, um, yeah, just kind of see how fast I can go. I, I got slower from my first one to my second one. And I think a lot of it was because I just wasn't running a lot. I felt like I was very anaerobically fit. I'm certainly very strong from all of the CrossFit training. But I mean, high rocks, you see the top guys like they're they're really good runners. So I mean, you really have to ramp up the running if you want to do well in high rocks. Yeah, for sure. If you had to pick a number right now in your head, what, what do you think is possible for Chicago? Time wise? Yeah. Um, well, I went 105, I think, 105 and change in the very first one I ever did. This last one was 107, 108. So I'm hoping I can get back to at least where I was in that first one. So I would say 104, 105 should be realistic. Cool. Yeah, that was kind of my my number I had in my head for, for Dallas. Well, when I was going to do it, I'm going to mm -hmm. kick it back now. Probably, I don't know, I might do Houston or a later one. I just don't think... I worry that I'll get hurt again if I try yeah, to push it not, too, too, too soon. It's not worth it, especially if you're going into it already with that thought of like, eh, I just don't feel great, you know. It's probably better just to to train in a more controlled environment because those races are like your adrenaline is going to take over and it's really easy right. to go harder than you may want to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's It's hard to have a governor in a race like that, yep. especially. So I don't know if you heard about the High Rock stuff this week that people were upset about. Essentially, so there's like – Elite 15, which mm -hmm. uh, was mainly comprised, this is my understanding, so if I get this wrong, nobody kill me, but mainly comprised of Europeans. Mm -hmm. And this is the U.S. championship. And so people like Rich Ryan and uh, Ryland Chadeg, they did not make uh, the cut. Oh, wow. Because those first spots were basically all Europeans. Mm -hmm. So the, the allure of the sport to me is still to kind of get into that elite 15 range. Mm -hmm. And now that, um, that whole thing has gone down, it makes Chicago even less of a priority for me. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah. Interesting. I, I mean, why do you think the times are so much faster? Do you think that some of the conditions are different overseas or is it just that those athletes have been doing it for a couple years longer? So they have been, you know, sports specific training for more years than our top guys. So I think it's a, I think there's two prong here. Um, I think if you look at the last couple years, Americans are better at mm -hmm. the top, top. Mm -hmm. um, so Hunter, Kent, Rich Ryan, like there's a couple guys who have been better. Like America finished one and two mm -hmm. last year. And that was after all of the sled times from Europe were faster than the US times. Mm -hmm. And then when it came to the actual championship, it went Hunter, Kent and then me for sled mm -hmm. times. So Which clearly the US. that was all three in the US. So clearly yeah. there was a difference in sleds there. I think it's hard to argue that. Yep. Uh, so this year it'll be interesting. I think the UK is deeper this year. Mm -hmm. I think like they have a wider span of athletes that mm -hmm. are at that top level. Like um, 
but it'll be interesting to see who the top guy is. I mm-hmm. think Dylan Scott, he ran a 58. That's what just 58 is what it's won fast. the uh, the UK championships. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there's no reason that he shouldn't be up yeah. there with those guys. It's been cool to see his progression. He raced in that invitational that I was involved in. He wasn't in our wave, but his time was maybe... 30 seconds a minute faster than mine. So if I was a 105, he was a 104. And now, yeah, he's breaking 60. He's really focused on the sport. I think he's uh, he's on the 10,000 team now. Yeah, he's got a little bit of that, something crazy about him. And, you know, he's got mm-hmm. a little bit, like a couple screws loose, which I think is what you kind of need. You, got, you have to. You got to have that level of commitment yeah. and, and burning desire to get to that level. Yeah, I mean, look at any of these top guys, whether it's Jordan, Lance Armstrong, like uh, anyone who has gotten to the pinnacle of their sport, they generally have some, you know, internal demon that is just like makes them so goddamn competitive with themselves, but also against others. I mean, you see most of these people that like, I'm competitive with myself. I'm not as competitive against others, but I feel like if you want to be, you know, the top dog in any sport, you got to just have this like burning fire in you either. You know, I think Lance, he had, you know, the cancer battle, that was his burning fire. And a lot of people just, I think they have something major they have to prove or they're doing it for some kind of cause or for, you know, their, their mother had cancer and they're doing it for their mom. Like you got to have some massive purpose Mm -hmm. that, that fuels your fire. If you want to be the top dog in anything. Yeah. I think my issue is mainly just sticking to one thing. Mm -hmm. And I think I see some of this in you as well Is like, I want to do so many things and experience so much that it's really not conducive to being the best at any particular thing. Yeah. So true. Yeah, you have to have blinders on to everything else to be the top guy. Um, And Iron Man for me, I got pretty close to the pinnacle of, you know, turning pro and being one of the best. But for me, it was, I loved CrossFit. I loved strength training. I liked keeping on some muscle mass. I liked having biceps. And, you know, the ultimately one of the reasons why I switched from triathlon to doing more CrossFit is I knew that the things that I, w- I was going to have to do, I didn't want to do. I was going to have to swim more and I was going to have to lose more weight. I was going to have to lose more muscle ma- mass. And, you know, those were things I just didn't want to do. And now it's so much more varied. But I mean, in those years, it was it was 20 to 25 hours of triathlon specific training every single week. And then I was supplementing it with CrossFit classes. Yeah, I think that's kind of one of the allures of High Rocks is because there's strength in it. And it's like a truly one hour time domain, at least at the elite level, you can still keep on some of that uh, some of that extra mass and look up naked and, you know, have the biceps versus I mean, even into OCR or triathlon at the Olympic distance, um, all of those, you're going to have to shed serious weight and get Mm -hmm. a lot smaller. Yeah. Weight matters with running a hundred percent high rocks. You know, the running is only five miles and it's only thousand meter intervals. So the weight doesn't matter as much as it does if you're running, you know, 10 plus miles, 10 plus miles, like weight is going to play a major factor in your pace on that run. Yeah. And it does, it's not advantageous to have more muscle mass. Yeah, for sure. So we were just kind of talking about being interested in a lot of different things. One thing that you've been developing, it seems like these last couple of years is the, the retreat aspect of your life. People, um, just want to hang out with you and be your friend. So people like Mm -hmm. to go to your retreats. Mm -hmm. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what you got going on with the retreats? What's involved with that? Uh, and how are those kind of transforming over the years? Yeah. So I mean, the reason why is I love in-person stuff so much more than just digital relationships. I think social media is an incredible way to meet people, but ultimately like deep bonds, they're formed in person. So like, I mean, that's why every single night we have people passing through the house to do sauna sessions and um, these retreats are just a way where... I can show people in person some of the protocols that have impacted my life so much and allow them to feel it. You know, I, I can show all day long our cold exposure and our sauna sessions and the workouts I do. And I think that's inspirational for others, but it's so much more impactful when someone can actually feel that. So that's why the retreats is I I want people to like feel the exact same things I felt in how I structure my day. So hitting a hard workout with a group of people, you know, rucking up a mountain and just like fist bumps at the top of the mountain. 
um, doing the contrast therapy in the evening, the conversations that you're going to have in the sauna, the bonds that are going to be formed, the connections that we're all going to be able to make for each other. They're so much more meaningful in person. So that's why I'm doing these one day retreats at our property. We have a really unique view. You know, we turf 1200 square feet of our backyard so we can do workouts in the backyard. And then we have multiple saunas and cold plunges at the house, red light therapy. My girlfriend, Sarah is a chiropractor. So it's basically, a full day of health and wellness, camaraderie, and just forming these bonds over overcoming obstacles throughout the day. And then some of the ones I'm co-hosting are uh, Live Better, my friends out of Chicago, two wellness retreats in Phoenix, Arizona, the end of February, the end of March. And then I'm hosting a three-day um, event with Brian Mazza called HPLT, High Performance Lifestyle Training, where it's going to be very much of what I do with the one-day retreats, but also incredible speakers. He's going to have some of the top brand builders, athletes, Navy SEALs. He has the guy who won Leadville the last two years speaking. Um, we're chatting with some other like just super high level people that will speak at that event. So, you know, that's a great opportunity if you're a, if you're building a brand to learn about what some of the most successful have done. And also it's just like type A personalities. You're going to meet amazing people that all are just incrementally pushing the ball forward. Everyone's looking to connect. Everyone's looking to challenge themselves. So it's a great group of human beings at those retreats. Yeah. When, when you are doing uh either like the nightly stuff or maybe there's a couple of nights where you have folks over and then you have a retreat later do you ever feel like host exhaustion from that or, or does that more give you energy um it gives me energy the majority of the time as long as i can get in like five days a week a one one hour to 90 minute mountain bike ride fat bike ride run by myself it, it refuels me so i'm ready for more people and more conversations Definitely hosting often when there's people in your space constantly, that wears on me a lot more just because I kind of like my mornings quiet. I like to have a little time to be able to plan my day. I need some space throughout the day to think creatively. And if I don't have that, then if I go too many days where I just feel like my space is invaded, I don't have any solitude, then it wears on me. But as far as like the transient crowd, that really never wears on me. I mm. love the transient crowd. Yeah, I'm always just impressed by you and Sarah and your guys' ability to be great hosts because sometimes it feels like I'm camping out in your kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah needs more space than I need. She'll she definitely gets the points where she's like, "Hey, let's do a full day of no one here." Yeah. <laughs> um, whereas for me, I could every single day have people coming to sauna and, and work out. If you had to go without one for the rest of your life, sauna or cold, you can only do one for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Which one would you keep? Damn, that's a really hard question. I don't know that I can answer that without some different context. So for like physical... whichever one, whichever one you don't keep, I blow all of them in the world up with a bazooka <laughs> and only one of them exists. Yeah. Well, let me walk through my choice of this because maybe I'll get to it in just talking. So the cold for me, I, I feel like you get more bang for your buck in a short amount of time. So physical recovery, mental recovery, just kind of resetting your nervous system, stress resilience, building a robust immune system. All of those, I'm going to pick cold exposure over sauna because you can jump in a cold stream in Colorado for three minutes and get all of those benefits in three minutes. Um, but from a community standpoint and forming deep bonds with people and attracting opportunities and my mind is just on fire after a 25 minute sauna session where I'm able to just like formulate all of these dots that I've collected over time in my head to make something of them. So for that reason, I love the sauna because I get so much mental clarity um, in that 25 minute sauna session. And when I'm doing sauna sessions with other people also, like there's just incredible bonds that are, that are formed from it. So I, I guess if you're an athlete and you're looking again for the physical benefits, if you're someone who's really stressed out and anxious, I would recommend the cold exposure. And if you're someone who like just wants incredible mental clarity and wants to form deep bonds with people, I think it would be tough to give up the sauna. Um, so 
I guess for me, I would probably pick the sauna just because that's, I love people so much. I love conversations. I love having mental clarity. I would pick that over, you know, a, a past life where I would be more interested in the physical benefits of the cold so that I could perform as an athlete at a, at a super high level. And obviously you're getting the physical benefits in the sauna too. I just don't think you're getting them as fast as you can get them by jumping in cold water. Sure. Yeah, I think it might surprise people. I think I was just thinking about this earlier today, and that's why I brought it up. And I honestly, my gut reaction is to pick sauna and delete mm -hmm. cold plunge. Mm -hmm. And the reason being, despite what we show on Instagram, like the cold sucks. Mm -hmm. Like it is, it is miserable. And like until you, like until halfway through your cold plunge and in the that period after your cold plunge, the anxiety leading up the beginning of the cold plunge, all misery, mm -hmm. pure misery. Mm -hmm. So I think like my gut reaction would be to pick the sauna because I actually enjoy it. I have fun. Like it's not that I painful. Love the sauna. Yeah, it's, I can hang out there for a while. Agree. And I mean, I love the cold too, but I agree with you. It's like type two fun. It's like the CrossFit workout I did this morning. Like there were times when I was in it where I'm like, this fucking hurts. But when you get done, you're like, damn, I feel so good now. And it's just, it's an achievement oriented thing. Like when you finish up with the sauna, like you had a great time and you had great conversations with people, but it's not the same achievement oriented satisfaction that you get from being in cold water where you just overcame something. But I agree with you. I mean, sauna is probably what I would, what I would pick, even though I love both of them. When you say you feel good, mm -hmm. what does that mean? So like you, you feel good after a workout or you feel good after these recovery methods. What, like for somebody that, you know, is sitting on their couch and has never done any of this, describe what that feels from like a physical or mental perspective. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, being completely in the moment, I think is a superpower. And I think that is something that makes me really happy when I am not thinking about anything else. I just, I want to keep doing what I'm doing forever. It, it feels like I could, you know, I've, mm. I've had Ironman races where in a weird way, like I was so in the moment that it felt like time just stopped and I was just in complete flow state for that entire race. I've had other Ironmans where from f four minutes into the swim, I'm like, God damn it. This is a 10 hour day of doing this. I don't want to fucking do this. <laughs> I wish I was a spectator watching someone else do this. Yep. Um, so presence, I think, is a big part of happiness for me, and that's being completely in the moment, um, feeling alive. When I, you know, when we do the cold exposure, when we do workouts, when we hit a run, like you feel so alive in doing that. And, you know, obviously that's the endorphins, that's the mental clarity that you're getting from it, that's the energy. And then times when, you know, I don't feel good is a time where, you know, I'm just like end endlessly scrolling through, you know, Instagram, I'm bored, I'm wishing I was doing something else. Um, I don't feel like doing anything. My mind is wandering. I don't have mental clarity. I feel like I have brain fog. Um, I have sh just kind of shitty low energy. That would be like a not feeling good day. And, you know, typically that could be a day after a big, big dopamine dump. So, I mean, one of the reasons why I don't compete that often anymore is because I know the high that I'm going to get from that event, that there's going to be a few down days after it. Like in the Ironman years, like the high that I would get afterwards was ridiculous. But, you know, it would be a week or so after where you just don't feel as good. You just kind of feel low energy. Obviously, you're sore and achy and I don't like feeling like that anymore. I like feeling very similar day in and day out. Mm. Yeah, for me, I think the key, uh, and this has taken me a couple of years of racing to learn, is to immediately get back and do something that next day. Mm -hmm. Like if you, uh, it sounds counterintuitive, but if I have a big race and I have a re like a full rest day the day after, mm -hmm. it is straight misery. Yeah. So if I have, even when um, I did that Rio Grande 100 the next day, like, really sore legs but i still tried to make sure that i got up and did at least something mm -hmm. and like try to get back to normalcy as soon as possible because mm -hmm. for me it's not only mental but it's or not only physical but the mental too yeah so if people always ask like aren't you tired all the time and i'm like no exerting energy fuels energy like mm -hmm. i just got done with a two-hour crossfit session i am energized right now i'm not tired whatsoever yeah. so 
Yeah, for me, exerting energy fuels energy. And that's why so much of my day is built around movement because I know for me that yields the best version of myself. Whereas sitting around for me doesn't yield the best version of myself. Yeah, I mean, it's that same thing where when you sleep like 12 hours and you wake up, you've never been more tired than that moment you wake yeah, up. You, you don't wake up. Yeah, you don't wake up feeling like you're bouncing around. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, and one more thing you were saying is like the, the feel good piece. I've been trying to dissect that feeling after you get through like a really hard Metcon or mm -hmm. a ruck or something where you're just like redlining for like a long time. And for me, I feel like I'm worthy. Like I, I used the day mm -hmm. and like I, I was worthy of being there for, mm -hmm. for that moment to the point where it's like I used it well. Mm -hmm. The thing that hurts me or makes me feel bad is when I waste a day, like mm -hmm. the opposite of worthiness. And mm -hmm. that's the most painful. It's like, oh, well, I just crapped that day away and didn't do anything with it. Yeah, I mean, I think Tony Robbins said this, that progress is happiness. And it's 100% the case for me. Like better than yesterday. That's a, you know, a, a motto I live by where just every day, just kind of incrementally pushing the ball forward. And even if it's not, you know, it might not be, I'm stronger today than I was yesterday, but I did those things that yielded progress and yield happiness. Yeah. So for me, that's why the days are all pretty similar with, you know, my workouts structured, my recovery session structured, because I know those things that yield happiness for me that are progress oriented behaviors. Are you getting chirped a lot more now because your life is like more public and on social media? Do you have people just like, oh, why don't you do something else with your life? Why do you do the same thing every day? <laughs> yeah, get a construction job. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> definitely. Yeah. I mean, as as your audience grows, you know, you're going to have people who have opinions about your lifestyle. And, you know, more often than not, it's if if I have a social media post that lands in the explore feed and, you know, it gets in front of someone who has no clue who I am and they just see something I'm doing, that's when the opinions come out. But if it's someone who's followed me for a bit and understands my lifestyle, then I very rarely get negative feedback from any anyone who is, you know, someone who knows who I am from a, from a digital standpoint. Sure. So for the next year, you were talking about the, the triple bypass. Is there, cause uh, for folks that don't know what this is also, my mom's going to do it with me, Epic. which is pretty sick. She's been wanting like one of her big goals for 2023 is to do a hundred mile bike ride. So mm -hmm. I figured why not do one of the hardest hundred mile bike rides that's available. Mm -hmm. um, so she's going to do that with me. And that is kind of tap like, tapping into like ultra distance length. And I, mm -hmm. I really think of Ironman, true Ironman as being an ultra race. Mm -hmm. Is there other, are you interested in that ultra distance stuff? Like um, 20, 30 mile runs, 40 mile runs, or are you really sticking more to like the one hour time domain? So I just feel like I, I lived that chapter of my life from 2010 to 2015, where I was addicted to how far can I go? And the last five or so years have been more like how strong can I get and how anaerobically fit can I get? So I focused on that more and I've enjoyed that more, but with so many of my friends getting into more endurance type sports, I am starting to like think about, okay, maybe the next five years, I kind of go back to the endurance um, because I am getting to a point now where the gains are, are harder to come by with the strength and anaerobic mm -hmm. capacity. Whereas, you know, when I, when I made the switch, like those gains came pretty fast, just like with the endurance side of things. Like when I learned the process of endurance training, the gains over a several year period came pretty fast. And then I got to a point where it was like, okay, I'm training 25 hours a week and all I'm, you know, gaining is maybe one minute in a 10 hour race. So, you know, it obviously gets a little frustrating when you're just kind of going through the motions, but it would be fun to go back into Ironman. And it honestly has been really fun the last two months getting back into running because, you know, I was like, I don't know, low eight pace, mid eight pace, even at an aerobic heart rate, having not run a ton over the last three years. Um, and the last two months of like really focusing back in and on running, like I've been able to drop my pace substantially. So, 
um, it's cool to know I have that in the bank. And if I want to go back to it, that, you know, focus on it for three or four months and I can get back to a really good place with it. So I am intrigued with the endurance stuff again. <clears throat> and I'm very much a creature of habit. Like when I'm doing something, I kind of go all in on it. So I've been all in on the strength training and, you know, following Matt Frazier's HWPO for the last two and a half years. And it would be cool to like have a two or three year block of more of the endurance stuff. Just again, because like the environment here just kind of begs you to do that and our friend group is getting more into that stuff yeah and i also think there's a lot more you know aptitude for adventure mm -hmm. so you have like for me have you heard of masogi like the the idea of having a masogi mm -mm. it's a thing that i heard about from jesse itzler first it's basically like a personal goal that feels unrealistic impossible mm -hmm. and you attempt like one a year i think i'm gonna try and do like five this year mm -hmm. but for example I'm doing the Mount Morrison Marathon, which doesn't mm -hmm. exist. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try and do it seven times, uh, which would be a 26.2 mile race, 14,000 feet of elevation. So mm -hmm. I think it'll be, if not the highest elevation marathon in the country or maybe in the world, it'll be close. So cool. And I'm going to do it solo being that it's not a race. It's just you versus you. And mm -hmm. I think endurance sports allows you to set these things up in your life where you don't have to go out and race, but you can just make these challenges. Mm -hmm. It's harder to be like, okay, my Masogi is going to be benching 300 pounds. It's not, it's not quite the same spirit, but if sure. it's, I'm going to hike over this mountain with a log on my back, you can kind of create those challenges. Yeah. I think they're cool. Yeah. I love how, I mean, COVID kind of shaped this a bit where pre COVID, it was very much like Ironman marathon. Like you compete in a sanctioned event for a time and through COVID with all of the, those events down, like the fastest known time and Strava segments, like all of that and all of these unique challenges I feel like really blew up and it's cool to see the creativity around it. Like our, our buddy, Mike Moralia did this strongman marathon and wild. the Utah salt flats wild. And like the Mount Morrison, for those of you unfamiliar with Mount Morrison, this is one of the steepest mountains in the front range. It's literally just like bent over lunging with your hands on your knees up 2000 feet, 1.7 miles. Um, to do that for a marathon, I mean, I'm gassed after doing it once. That's going to be, it's going to wreck you. Yeah. Um, but it's been cool to see like all of these just super creative ideas come out. And I'm wondering if, you know, various events are going to come out of this, yeah. you know, new unique challenges that combined maybe the hybrid athlete, you know, strength with endurance. Yeah. And, and that's kind of my thought process behind some of this stuff is, I really think it would be cool one day to host events like this, mm -hmm. probably on a really small scale because that's kind of my vibe. Mm -hmm. But, you know, do some of these things myself, get a feeling for what could work as like future races or challenges and mm -hmm. like just keep trying to innovate because I feel like there's a lot of room for creativity, especially in the endurance world. So much. Yeah. So I don't know. We'll see. Maybe one day there will be a officially sanctioned Mount Morrison <laughs> marathon. I love it. Um, so are you faster than me? Am I faster than you? Man, I got to be getting close now with all the running. Okay. I mean, you know, the 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 results speak for themselves. Ryan beat me in the last high rock. So as of right now with official results, I am not faster. But we'll see. I mean, Chicago, we'll see if I can do what What did you get in uh, Dallas? 105? 107. 107? Okay. Yeah. So if I can get 104, 105, I think that would be like, I could say I'm faster than you I think until I think, you do your next one. Yeah, no, I, I think you can get 105. I think, yeah. I think, I mean, barring any like unforeseen circumstances, I think if you run, you know, good pace, because really, actually, it's funny enough, you actually beat me on your runs last time. I don't, I don't know how that happened, but you would think that I would beat you in runs and you would yeah. beat me in stations. We actually flip-flopped somehow. Wild. Um, so it'll be interesting to yeah, see. Yeah, I went in Dallas reflecting on it. I definitely went too hard on the sled um, in like the very first segment of it. I pushed it unbroken, just thinking like I am really strong right now. I've been doing a ton of CrossFit. Like I'm going to manhandle this sled compared to everyone else. And I think that really... Like I, I always think of things as matches, like in events, you only have so many matches you can burn before you've just, your glycogen is gone. And I burned a match in that, that first leg of the sled push. And I knew it. Like, I'm like, fuck, my heart rate is jacked right now. Right. And I had to rest several times for very, very long breaks. Whereas, you know, I think what I should do, what I'm going to do in Chicago is just do half 
take a 15, 10 second break, 15 second break, half, 10 second break, half, and just like check that strength ego of like, I can move this sled because I'm so strong, knowing how much it affected me the rest of the, the race. I feel like the next 10 minutes, I couldn't get my heart rate down from the, from the sled push. And then, you know, towards the end, um, my, my heart rate started to chill a bit and some of those movements are pretty good for me. And I was able to kind of, you know, catch my stride again, but yeah, I think I went too hard with it and it affected everything else in that race. So yeah, I'm going to more strategy on the sled. And then, I mean, the running again, I, I have not ramped up running for a high rocks. I've been really focused on the CrossFit training. You know, it's not like I'm not a runner, but I hadn't been running more than, you know, maybe five or 10 miles a week up until the last two months where I've been trying to put in 30 and 40 mile weeks. So I think that's going to help a lot and doing the runs every afternoon after already having done the CrossFit sessions. So mm -hmm. it's running on fatigued legs, which is very much what high rocks is. Yeah. I think that's important to structure it that way. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because I've actually heard Hunter talk about that. Um, I think he was saying 15 steps and no negotiation. So mm. basically, no matter what, whether they're good 15 steps or a bad 15 steps, it's mm -hmm. 15 steps and break. Great strategy. Which it, yeah. And I mean, if you're familiar with high rocks, you're not stepping a yard per foot. They're very small. So he's mm -hmm. not even, you're talking about the best guy in the world, not even doing full lengths. Yeah. And I'm in quite the opposite camp, which is my best times. I only took two breaks during the four laps. Mm -hmm. And the reason being for me is like, I would like to get under tension as few times as possible because mm -hmm. I feel like if you're going to keep putting yourself on tension mm -hmm. and then un or like under tension and then taking off the gas mm -hmm. that you're eventually just doing more reps. Sure. So I, I don't know what the better uh, what the better strategy is, but I think there's a lot of science. I think that's one of the fun things about high rocks and why I'm interested in it is like it's so new that everyone's like still yeah, figuring, figuring out, out the landscape. Very much so. You can and we were talking about Dylan earlier is like he puts in like crazy volume, probably like no one else on the planet. Mm -hmm. And a lot of other people tend to strength train more, which mm -hmm. he historically was doing less. And no one can say what's right. Mm -hmm. Like people can say, oh, you're doing too much volume, but nobody actually knows. Maybe it's the perfect amount of volume. It's mm -hmm. hard to say because I mean, there was a world record set last year. There's probably gonna be more set this year or mm -hmm. no, the female world record was broke twice this year mm -hmm. so the times are just getting faster it's hard to say what the right approach is versus something like iron man where it's like here is the formula mm -hmm. and execute this to the best of your ability and you're probably going to do really well yeah definitely but so i mean to bring it back to iron man um like i wasn't doing triathlons every day you know i was focusing on a run at a certain heart rate i was focusing on a bike ride at a certain heart rate mm -hmm. you know there were brick workouts maybe once a week where i would run off the bike and then the swims were always individual it was very rare that i would do kind of all of them back to back to back um prior to an actual triathlon so i mean that's kind of how i was thinking of high rocks is that like you need to build an aerobic base running. You need to do some speed work running. So you have some of that threshold ability. You need to do some running after some of the events. So after maybe a sled push, which is probably the most taxing on your legs and your nervous system. And then, you know, I thought of the stations as more anaerobic where like you build some anaerobic capacity in each of those stations. So like you work on, you know, 250 meter row intervals, 250 ski intervals with short rest in between them. Um, farmers carry, you know, working on unbroken sets, burpee broad jumps, unbroken sets, you know, some short rest, unbroken set till you get to the distance and kind of breaking it down the way I broke down triathlon. I don't know if that's right or wrong, but um, yeah, I mean, I never did a triathlon in training. It was really focusing on each of those individual sports and then putting them all together for race day. Yeah. And there's all of that. And then there's still the possibility that you just show up and your body's not ready that day. It's, true. it's yeah. such a, it's such a gamble. Like I've gone out there and had days where I just feel, and particularly Dallas, I felt really crappy during that race. It was one of those ones where like I started and I felt like crap the entire time. Yeah. And it's just, I, I feel like you also said you felt rough during that. Yeah, I did. It's, it's so interesting. Like, and maybe someone in the strength world will critique this, but I feel like strength 
you know, when I, when I deadlift 405, like I can deadlift 405, like you put me in a competition. And as long as I didn't like bang myself up the day before, like I have that strength. There's not that much mental to it. You know, if I've clean and jerked 300, then, you know, I probably will clean and jerk 300, but I feel like with cardio based events, the mental side of it plays into it so much of like, how hard can you push? Because there's a vast difference between pegging your heart rate at 150 and pegging your heart rate at 160. And I know I can peg my heart rate at 160 for an hour, but sometimes I don't because I just mentally don't have it in me and I only peg it at 150 for an hour. And that's going to be a major discrepancy in time. Mm. Same with running, you know, I mean, you know, I can run a 5k at a 165, 170 heart rate. Do I want to? No, it freaking hurts. So some days if I'm really stoked on life, I'll do that. But most days I won't push myself that hard mentally. Yeah. Yeah. That was the kind of the post I was talking about yesterday. I, uh, <clears throat> I did a retreat with a lot of CEOs this past week and, a lot of them have dedicated so much time to their business that mm -hmm. they've kind of let off the gas in their own health and fitness. Mm -hmm. And I got a lot of questions about running and a lot of intrigue with like the endurance world. Mm -hmm. And I think the number one thing that people think when they see us and the, the worst part about it is Strava and Instagram because they mm -hmm. only see people running fast. But the reality is we don't run fast, mm -hmm. like, like maybe 20%. I think you can get building blocks to high rocks, maybe 30% mm -hmm. fast a week, mm -hmm. right? And that is a really intense week. If 30% of your miles are really hard, mm -hmm. those are that's a lot of mileage at a high heart rate, mm -hmm. but you don't see that. And that's why one of my biggest recommendations for beginners is to not use Strava. Mm -hmm. We have this idea or we have this natural thing where social pressures are our strongest indication of our actions. Mm -hmm. There's interest-free loans that are based on social pressure in mm. third world countries where people don't have to charge interest. The loans will be repaid just because everyone else in the village knows that mm. you have a loan out. Mm -hmm. The same thing happens with running. Mm -hmm. If we have Strava on, we know all our friends are going to see it. Mm -hmm. We're not going to run 10, mi 10 minute miles. Mm -hmm. We're just not going to let it happen. I'm mm -hmm. not going to let my friends see that. Mm -hmm. And it's damaging if you're a, a new runner. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. I definitely think about Strava when I'm out there and very much thought about it in the Ironman days of getting like different Strava segments and the fastest loop around Oneida Lake. That was very much on my radar. It was almost a race every day. But, you know, I also was at a point where for me, I could do that at an aerobic heart rate. So even though I'm going fast, like you might see my run pace at 640, but I'm doing it at a 130 heart rate. That's my aerobic pace. Sure. And, you know, that is fast but I'm doing myself justice running in my heart rate zone. Right. So people that reach out to me and they're like, well, you're running 630s. I'm like, yeah, but I'm doing it at 130 heart rate. If it, if that means 10 minute miles for you, you know, that's what you need to run at to build the durability and build the aerobic engine that I have because this wasn't always the case for me. You know, in 2010, my, my mile pace was 845 at a 140 heart rate. It took four years of that zone two Maffetone training to get to that 630 heart rate or to 130. Yeah. I think a better way to say it for a lot of beginners is conversational pace because yeah. that's like something we can all instantly relate to. Okay, I can hold a conversation. Yeah. And you can even do it in your head. Like, okay, you might think you're at conversational pace, but say something out loud. Say uh, the Pledge of Allegiance out loud while you're running. Can you say it in a controlled way? Mm -hmm. If not, there's no way you're in zone two. Mm -hmm. You're just simply, you're, you're over your heart rate range. Yeah, I think most people, they run at like a 160 heart rate, 170 heart rate. And you know, you're going to burn calories. That's great. But if you're looking to be a good endurance athlete, like you need to put in more volume at a lower heart rate to build the aerobic engine and also to build your durability. Um, because at that high of a heart rate, you're just not going to be able to put in that many miles. You're taxing your nervous system too much. Mm -hmm. So switching gears here a little bit, this is a interesting one that Lauren actually posed to me as a, a thought experiment. And I'll give you some time to think about it if you need it. But if there was one word that you wished people would use to describe you, mm -hmm. but they never would, what would that word be? Oh, wow. One word to describe you, but they never would. I was going to say impact as far as to describe me, but I think people would say I've had impact. Um, geez, that's a tough one. I mean, it's, it's a good one, though. Yeah. I mean, one word that people would never describe me as is being chill, but I don't know that I care to, to <laughs> say whether I'm chill or not. Um, I don't know. 
because it's uh, it's it's kind of asking a question where um, I, don't, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> it, it, the the question under the question is what do you want to be that you aren't right? Yeah, because you know and. I think the word I used was my first reaction was brave. And then I got pushed back on that. She said that maybe somebody would say that, but like, I don't know. That was the the first word that came to my head. And I think initially the word that comes to your head first is probably the right one, but I definitely, I wouldn't call you chill, but do you want to be called chill? No, I don't want to be called chill. Definitely not. I mean, I can tell you something that I'm not good at that. I wish I was good at. I wish I was better at, um, just like embracing conflict. I definitely don't like embracing conflict. Mm-hmm. Like I a hundred percent like being nice to people and adding value. And, you know, I think sometimes it can almost be to, to a fault where I just avoid conflict because I would rather just like be nice and just let, uh, let a relationship, let a friendship, um, just kind of go on autopilot instead of having that hard conversation. Mm. So maybe it's like bold. Um, yeah. Like bold in terms of conflict resolution. Yeah, I don't, I don't I like know. that. Maybe maybe bold. I don't. Yeah. I don't know. But because you are bold in some ways, but bold in, in that specific. I'm definitely not bold in that way of like embracing conflict or um, allowing for conflict in my life. Yeah. Have you seen that take like negative repercussions? Like, have you ever yeah, seen definitely. that like get carried away? Yeah. I mean, I think you can go through the motions for too long in things because you just don't want to have that hard conversation. Yeah. For me, it seems like when that hard conversation doesn't happen, then it comes to like some sort of explosion. Yeah. It's like you just let you kick the can down the road and then one thing leads to another. And ultimately it ends up being a much bigger deal than it probably would have been. Agree. Yeah. All right, man. Well, I've had a excellent time. Always a great time having you. Uh, I look forward to our, our next battle and uh, all the adventures Likewise. to come. Let's go for a run. All right, man. Cheers, brother. Bye, guys. Stay wild. Love you. That was awesome. Yeah, that was great.